Hey everyone, welcome to Martelloup Church, and uh, happy Palm Sunday, the last Sunday before Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Today, we are going to continue our pre-Easter Lenten art series with a look at a very famous 600-year-old painting by Russian iconographer Andrei Rublev. And while I'd come across this painting many times over the years, it wasn't until I read a book by a Benedictine monk, Gabriel Bunga, that book right there, which if you're really into icons and this message and that piece of art is uh, definitely worth getting a hold of. It wasn't until I read that book a couple years ago that I really understood what Rublev's famous painting, Icon, is all about. And for the record, anything knowledgeable I say about that icon from now on going forward uh, would have come from what I learned reading Bunga's book. So this is the painting, the icon, from left to right depicting the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son in the center, and the Holy Spirit. And with you, the viewer, positioned at the open end of the table facing this open and receptive community of God. A God who wants to know you more. Jesus prayed uh, once exactly for that, that we would be able to know and experience the love and unity of this holy community more. He prayed, I pray also for those who will believe in me, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now looking at this painting, you can almost overhear Jesus saying those words to the Father inviting us, praying that we would feel invited to and respond to the invitation to uh, sidle up to this table. Rublev's Trinity is what those in Orthodox Christian circles call an icon. An icon is something through which we can engage the presence of God. And the idea was that this piece of art could help you connect to God's ever-present presence in and through a creative, imaginative, and tangible kind of way. So, this is the goal of today's message, to help you know in whose presence you're standing, you're living right now, to help us all know. So, uh, to that end, please join me in a prayer. Father in heaven, uh, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, uh, our triune God, we come to you now and pray and ask that <clears throat> this beautiful image of being invited to your table um, would be and could be and might be a means through which we could step closer uh, to you, to reality, to knowing uh, the God before whom we are living our lives. And so to that end, uh, hear our prayer and uh, glorify your name, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, in this message, I'm going to in two big categories, talk about two things. First, I want to tell you the story of how this 600-year-old icon came to be, a bit of its artistic provenance. And then second, um, hope to spend some time actually entering into the painting and experiencing, hopefully, in a kind of mystical way, um, trying to discern and experience um, the presence of God and, and what this uh, historic icon can mean in terms of engaging that presence. 
So the story of Rublev's Trinity began in the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis. And before I read it to you, just a bit of broader context. In, in the previous chapter, before the one I'm going to read, God uh, had met with Abraham and had just made a covenant, um, an agreement, a promise to him, promising to make him into a great nation. And even though at that time, Abraham, Abraham and Sarah, his wife, they had no children at all, God promised that he would make him, them, the fathers uh, and the father and mother of many, many souls. In God's words, look at the sky and count the stars, Abraham, so shall your offspring be. Abraham was 99 years old at the time, and his wife Sarah was barren. And yet, God promised him, promised them, the impossible. Because with God, all things are possible. For Abraham and Sarah, and now broadening the context to you, for you and for yours and for your life. And so this Genesis 18 story I'm about to read, it plays out in the life of a man who's just been made an amazing promise and who I would imagine is now actively waiting and um, paying attention for uh, the way God fulfills that promise, waiting for God to show up. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. So this is how God, the Lord, uh, that verse says, appeared to him. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby, and when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent, like a good Middle Eastern person would, wanting to extend hospitality, to meet them, and bowed low to the ground. And he said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree." And let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. And so Abraham hurried into, his, into, the, into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sias of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. And then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. And then he brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. And while they all ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where, where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. And then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. So God, the, the Lord, came to Abraham in the form of three men. And Abraham extended hospitality to them, to God, through them. And after their meal, one of them prophesied what God had promised that Abraham would have a son. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, the author of that book references this story by saying, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people, i.e. Abraham, have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. And in the Bible, angels are always understood to be messengers of God. Their words were synonymous with God's words, and their presence was indicative of God's very real presence. And while Abraham's three visitors looked like men, they were in fact God's angels, God with Abraham in that moment through that visit. And again, Remember how the passage starts. The Lord, and this is the writer of Genesis framing that story, 
the Lord appeared to Abraham in this mysterious way. And then later in the story, it's repeated that this was the Lord who had come to visit him in this way. In one of the oldest depictions of this story, a fourth century fresco found in the Via Latina catacomb in Rome, uh, the three visitors are portrayed as just three men, three rather boyish looking men, as you can see. No wings, no halos, but, but back then, when you painted angels, angels were mostly, though not exclusively, represented in this way as beardless youths in white garments. A century later, the theology of this Genesis story develops a little bit further, and in this mosaic from the Santa Maria Maggiore Church in Rome, which we actually visited, but it was closed that night. Oh, could have seen this live. In this mosaic, the, the three figures have nimbi, halos, uh, above their heads. And the center one, on the top left, was completely encircled in a halo, signifying a kind of sacredness and holiness. Now, by the 12th century, the three visitors had sprouted wings, and this mosaic is from the Cathedral of Mont Real in Palermo, Sicily. And if you look closely at the middle angel, uh, his left hand, he's holding a scroll, and the symbolism of that clearly meant to the viewer of that day that this person was the Lord. And then, a few more centuries pass by, a few more visual iterations of this story, and then in the 15th century came Rublev's Troitsa, the, the Holy Trinity. And this one icon, after all of that evolution of artistic icons, uh, many think most fully captures, most eloquently and beautifully captures the Genesis 18 story. So reading Gabriel Bunga's book, I, I learned a lot about all of these iconic paintings, um, these sometimes pretty strange looking pieces of religious art from another time that I never really understood. Um, but for them back there, the people for, that would be engaging these icons, this is how they were taught in many cases, the gospel stories. And this is how, through the artist, they thought through their theology. Uh, where most of that happens in recent centuries uh, through words and writing uh, for us today, um, us modern folks, back then, they did a lot of their theology visually. Bunga writes that what the words of a sermon are for the ear, so icons are for the eye. And of course, there are lots of advantages to communicating this way, uh, doing your theology this way. If you think about it, um, you can say a lot with words, but you can't say everything. And we are multi-sensory beings. All of us learn in different ways, so this would be a good way or maybe the best way for some of us. And of course, in an Engaging God Everywhere church that believes that God speaks so many languages in and through the world and through life, look at the creation that surrounds you. God speaks color and shape and perspective and depth. If, if God is that kind of God, then icons make sense in terms of our thinking about God, our doing of theology. And perhaps for visual learners, again, this uh, may be for all of us who have eyes again. Um, this is a beautiful other way of trying to understand God more. So in the Orthodox Christian tradition, the Eastern tradition, icons were included in church services right alongside the sermon. And the development of these iconic images was considered theological development, visual theological 
development. So even as you know, we believe that the Holy Spirit providentially whispers to theologians so that they can better articulate a deeper understanding about the nature of God via the words of the Bible, we believe, or they believe, and I believe, the Spirit also whispered to painters and artists so that they would be able to articulate a deeper understanding about the nature of God via, via their brush. Because there are some things, there are simply some things about God that words cannot capture or fully express. And so, back to Rublev's, Rublev's Trinity, uh, this image of three men, now three angels, but also the Lord, um, what does this painting teach us about the nature, the theology of the Holy Trinity of God? And the answer is lots, more than you're going to get in the next few minutes of this message, but a few key truths that really struck me. Um, one of them is that uh, the theological truths developed over the centuries in painting this story, um, they, they really helped bring out the, uh, what other theologians in words uh, called the perichoretic nature of God. Uh, this idea of perichoresis is a theological term that holds that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are in relationship with one another, this triune God, um, an intimate relationship of love, a kind of holy dance of eternal community. And in earlier depictions of the Genesis 18 Trinity um, story, um, all three of these characters uh, are painted directly facing the viewer. But in Rublev's version, and this is where everybody, I think, finds it the best version of this story, they are all oriented towards each other, even as they still are kind of facing you, us, the viewer. And that, of course, is beautifully emblematic of God's orientation to you. Um, when God invites you into community, into relationship with God, and extends hospitality to you in that way, he invites you into an already there, eternal, loving um, community of, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And again, that invitation is the reason or that openness to invite or that openness uh, that we are called to potentially step into. It's why Rublev painted that open space at the table. Now, if you're imaginative, can you imagine being seated at that table with God? Uh, getting that close to God? Close enough to see Jesus' face? To hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? To feel the presence of our Heavenly Father? So let's try this out this icon and do a little spiritual exercise and see if we can feel and experience all of those things or maybe something else that God would have you experience. So as you look at this image now, I am going to read a collection of New Testament excerpts that Gabriel Bunga initially gathered and um, uh, people would read these verses as they were looking at this particular painting. And your job is to listen to the words I say as you contemplate uh, visually the image. And as both of those things are happening, let the words and the image and the Spirit of God, let, that, let them all talk together. Okay, so not too much uh, tell you what to do, but listen to the words, look at this, ain't, look at this image. Um, I'll start with a short pause. No one knows the Son except the Father, Jesus said, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. 
and no one can come to the Son except the Father draws them and gives them this coming. But the one through whom the Father reveals the Son and through whom he draws humankind to the Son is the same, the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and comes to us through the Son. It is the Spirit and the Spirit alone who makes possible the confession of the Son as Lord. It is the Spirit and the Spirit alone who gives you eyes to see and ears to hear. For the Spirit takes from the Son and glorifies the Son. The Spirit bears witness to him and causes Jesus' followers, causes you to remember all that he has said to you. For this is the task of the Holy Spirit, whom the Son has sent in his stead. This Spirit is a Spirit of adoption. This Spirit has been sent to remind us that we are God's children, his offspring. Through the Holy Spirit living within us, God abides with us forever. The Spirit unites us with the Son who alone ensures access to the Father. Those who love me, Jesus says, will keep my word. And my Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. You are invited into that kind of eternal, divine community of love. And every individual uh, person of the Trinity, one God, is, is part of that calling, inviting process. Now, some have interpreted this icon as they think, or they've posited, um, that this icon is painting that and that relationship and that uh, interdependent kind of community at the exact moment where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are making the, de the decision to send Jesus into the world. Others, like uh, our Benedictine monk uh, friend Gabriel Bunga, sees this icon as capturing the moment just before they made the decision to send the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And how beautiful to think of God thinking about that, pondering a time and the right time and place for those kinds of things. And, and I guess either way or whatever way, uh, I believe this is an image of the Holy Trinity, uh, a, a divine community of God, that is talking about and, and thinking about you, about us, about humankind that they have made. Our lives are filled with icons, uh, with parables that give evidence to God's presence, God's calling presence, just like this icon of Rublev's Trinity. And all of those icons, in a way, if they reveal something about the nature of God, all the things we've talked about in this church are, are an affirmation of a God who's thinking about you, who's inviting you, who's ever calling you by his spirit. So, so can you see what you're being invited into? And, and the way this icon invites you uh, visually is also a very interesting thing I learned. Uh, Bunga writes that icon painting makes use of its own principles. It consciously submits to its own rules and thus renounces much of what is essential for, for worldly painting. So 
It rejects what the world considers to be the natural or central perspective, which issues from the standpoint of the beholder, you and I, people looking at the image, and chooses what can be considered the unartistic reverse perspective, which forces the beholder to surrender his or her own standpoint, his or her sense of distance. And likewise, with icons, neither are shapes and objects illuminated from the outside, which is a standard way of painting, but rather they have their own source of light within themselves. Now, before I read Bunga's book and I would see this particular icon and others like it, I thought these artists back then, they obviously didn't know perspective and they couldn't see straight. But now, reading those words, I realize that I'm the one who couldn't see straight. Reverse perspective is, uh, I mean, we, it, it, the way we expect to see it is like you see a road going off into to the horizon. It's kind of wide on the front of the screen, and then it gets on the painting, of the surface of the painting, and it gets the two lines kind of come together to a vanishing point, right? And what Bunga is saying when Rublev painted this icon is he flipped that around. So we're now at the vanishing point, and we're now not at the center of the universe, the perspective from which reality is seen. And, and that's a really crucial move that a person of faith needs to make in order to engage the mysterious, all-powerful, in many ways unknowable God. We need to be shaken out of the center of our universe um, so that we can then engage from a proper perspective, um, a not-me-centric perspective, the person of God. And, and this icon does that by totally flipping, uh, reversing the perspective of the image. And when that happens... It's not like then we're looking at God. It's like we're being looked at by God. And we realize and maybe can see with new eyes that, that God is where the light is. And God is the seer. And we are just the seen. And this icon according to Bunga, was also painted in inverse perspective. And this, if you thought that was a little abstract, this is even more abstract, but um, track with me. I'll read it slowly. He, he asks, but what if the seemingly obvious and natural point of view of the beholder is not at all that of the icon? What if, on the contrary, the scene of a meal, this scene of a meal is based on inverse perspective, in such a manner that the foreground of the picture in reality lies behind, so that the beholder sees something face to face that he can actually only see from behind. What if the icon, therefore, secures for the viewer an insight into an event, and this is indeed its essence, that would otherwise not be accessible to him or her at all. So maybe you remember that story, that Old Testament story of Moses, who uh, is about to meet God, but God says, go hide in the cleft of that rock because you cannot see my face, Moses, or you die from seeing the holiness of God. He could only, in that story, see God's back. But of course, the message of Palm Sunday le leading into Good Friday and Easter Sunday is that, but is that because of what Christ did through all of that, uh, we can see God's face again. In, in a letter to the Colossian church, the, the Apostle Paul writes that the Son is the image of the invisible God. And if you look at the Greek language that makes up that phrase translated into English, the word image is actually the Greek word icon. Jesus is the perfect icon, the only icon through which we can engage and see the image, see 
and invisible God. In Paul's letter to the Ephesian church, he uh, wrote another important uh, point in, in this uh, context. He, he wrote that through him, through Jesus, we have access to the Father by one Spirit. So this is the whole Christian gospel, right? That through Christ, we have access to an in invisible and unknowable God through the iconic nature of Christ, through Christ's death and resurrection. God invites us into relationship with God um, through that work, through this Jesus who came to us in real flesh and blood, like real paint and image and shape and color was used in that icon. This Jesus who came to us, we're remembering now, and died, would lay down his life for his friends, and then rose mysteriously in order to give life in abundance to his friends, to us, and through whom we now have access to the Father by one Spirit. And, and that's the message, right, of Easter, this beautiful resurrection, death and resurrection story we're stepping into in a few days, that, that through that story and through the iconic person of Jesus Christ, we now have a place at God's table. And right now, God is inviting you to take up your place, your place, into this community of deep intimacy and love, where the Father perfectly knows the Son and the Spirit, and the Son knows the Spirit and the Father, and the Spirit knows the Father and the Son and this triune God all together open toward you and facing you. They all, God knows you. This beautiful image of God accepting and reaching out to and receiving you, inviting you to a feast, inviting you to relationally feast on him. Now, in the middle of this ordinary, extraordinary life that he's given you, and then forevermore. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the gift of God for the people of God. And this is what we're all remembering. I hope we're all remembering this Easter season, that we are his and he is ours, and that we belong to God and are made to be at this table with him. Please uh, join me in a prayer. So Lord, help us to hear that invitation. Your words calling us as, as clearly as Abraham would have heard words coming from these men that were more than men that were there representing you. May we hear your words and, and see uh, how you are orienting yourself to us in perfect community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit turned toward us leaving a space, a door, a way, a road that we can step into, trot upon, follow, that leads to you. Make, make that real, God, for all of us. Make this uh, faith, this thousands of year old faith that you've given to previous generations that are, has now been passed on to us, that now in this moment we are living. Uh, make our understanding of your very palpable presence 
real and true, empowering and transformative, life-changing, so that you will be glorified, so that your church will be built, and so that this world can be healed and transformed, made new by your Holy Spirit living in us. So hear this, our prayer, and meet us now, we pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. inside me You call me out to pull me in You tell me I can start again and I don't need to keep on hiding I'm fully known And I'm loved by you You won't let go No matter what I do And it's not one or the other our truth and ridiculous grace to be known, fully known and loved by you. It's so like you to keep pursuing. It's so like me to go astray. Got my heart with your truth, the kind of love that's bulletproof. And I surrender to your kindness, I'm fully known. And love by you, I won't let go, no matter what I do. And it's not one or the other, it's our truth and ridiculous grace to be known. Fully known and loved by you, and fully known and loved by you. How real, how wide, how rich, how high is your heart? I cannot find the reason you have given me so much. How real, how wide, how rich, how high is your heart? I cannot find. Fully known and loved by you, you won't let go. No matter what I do, and it's no one or the other. It's hard truth and ridiculous grace to be known. Fully known and loved by you, I'm fully known. Thanks for joining us today. Now, church, my friends, those in Calgary and those down the block, those in Edmonton, may we go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may we rest easy and always be thinking about the fact that we are known by our God deeply and personally that we strive to know that God as well. Have a great week. See you at Easter.